One of the most time-critical decisions a pilot will ever take under normal circumstances is to reject a landing from low altitude or on the runway. But what if the aircraft in that situation refuses to follow the pilot's commands and instead does something completely unexpected? Stay tuned. Aircraft today are built to amazing safety standards and the certification process is now so detailed that it's almost impossible to grasp. On top of that, new requirements are added every time an incident or accident happens where a design weakness is uncovered. But no matter how detailed these certifications are, it's impossible to cover every single scenario, especially if outlined standard operating procedures are not completely followed. And this incident is a great example of that. On the 8th of April 2022, a crew from TAP, Air Portugal, was getting ready to operate a flight from Lisbon in Portugal up to Denmark and Copenhagen Airport. Since this was in April, spring had started to come to Lisbon, but the weather in Copenhagen was much less predictable, with strong, gusty winds, forecasted showers and a temperature of only a few degrees Celsius. This weather is typical for Scandinavia during April. In Sweden we actually have a word for it. April weather. And for pilots, this type of varying weather conditions can present several different challenges. In this case, the winds were forecasted to be blowing from 270 degrees at 20 knots, gusting up to 32, and since the runways in Copenhagen were oriented in either a southwesterly or northwesterly direction, this would mean that all runways would be subject to strong gusty crosswinds. The runway, which was closest to the wind direction, was also the shortest one, runway 30. So this was the runway that the pilots of this flight was expecting to get. The captain was 40 years old and had logged about 10,000 hours of total time. Out of those, he had flown around half on the Airbus A320, which was also going to be the type that they were operating on this day. The first officer that he was going to work with was 34 years old and had flown a total of 3,160 hours, the majority of which, over 2,000 hours, was on the A320 as well. Now, given the weather they were expecting in Copenhagen, coupled with the relatively short runway, they decided that the captain would act as pilot flying on the way up, which makes perfect sense to me. It is not uncommon that the captain will choose to operate flights who are a little bit more challenging since the responsibility ultimately rests with him or her. After the pilots had looked through the weather, they continued their free flight by checking through the flight plans, their notams and the technical notifications about the aircraft, but once they were finished, they proceeded by briefing their five cabin crew colleagues and then walked out to the apron to start their day. The aircraft they had been assigned for the flight was an Airbus A320-214, and according to the tech log, it was in very good flying condition. When the Airbus A320 family had been certified, it had come with two engine options, the International Aero Engines 2500 and the CFM56, which was the option fitted to this aircraft. This engine, and especially certain components of it, will become really important for this story, but I'll explain more about that later. The first officer completed his walk around as the captain was setting up the cockpit, and during that walk around the first officer had noticed nothing out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, the cabin crew welcomed the 102 passengers on board and once everyone was ready and the pilots had completed their pre-flight, the aircraft was pushed back and then started its engines. After having received their clearance, the pilots then taxied out and departed towards the northeast according to their flight plan. Everything was working completely normal at that stage. During the flight up towards Copenhagen, the pilots had plenty of time to look into the expected landing conditions in a bit more detail. Given that there were rain showers in the area, sometimes even containing snow, they assumed that the runway would be wet, which would mean a braking penalty and therefore an increased landing distance. Runway 30 was 2,365 meters long, but it only had 2,095 meters available for landing due to a displaced threshold. Now, that's not a lot of runway, but it wasn't terribly short either, especially since this flight only had 102 passengers on board, but the gusty winds made it a bit more complicated. You see, when we land on short runways, we typically want to use as much flaps as possible to lower our approach speed and provide more drag. But on the 737 that I fly, if we use higher flap settings, we typically also have less margins up to the flap over speed, since more basically is just hanging out, making it more sensitive. With less landing flaps, like flaps 30, it's a bit more stable to fly, and we therefore tend to use that for landings in very gusty conditions. But according to my Airbus friends, the Airbus A320 is actually a bit more stable with full flaps and doesn't have much less margins to overspeed either. 
So that makes the choice of flaps that these pilots ultimately decided on a little bit harder to understand. Now, there was a note in their manual saying that pilots should still consider using less flaps in gusty conditions, so maybe that was the reason behind their choice. I don't know. In any way, records show that they performed three different landing calculations, each with different auto brake and flap settings. Eventually, they decided to go with flaps in configuration 3, meaning 20 degrees of flaps and auto brake medium. Now, curiously, that was actually not one of the combinations that they had calculated with, but it would still give them a landing distance of 1540 meters, which was well within the available distance. They had made a calculation with flaps config 3 and low auto brake, which gave them a landing distance of 1930 meters, and that likely made them a little bit uncomfortable given that they only had around 2000 meters available, so increasing the auto brake even without making a further calculation would be logical. Now, I mentioned before that the pilots were expecting gusty crosswinds for the landing, so now it's probably a good time to explain why that would be a potential problem. In short, as pilots, we don't really care about crosswind when we're flying at higher altitudes, since up there, it just means that the aircraft will have to point its nose into the wind in a way that guarantees that the intended track is being followed. And that wind correction angle is the difference between heading and track, by the way. But when it comes to the takeoff and landing, the aircraft all of a sudden have to adapt to land on a strip that is fixed in a certain direction on the ground. This means that we have to maneuver the aircraft to align with that final approach track, just like you would do in a boat who needs to cross a river to a specific mooring on the other side. As we approach the runway, we would point the nose into the wind to ensure that we keep following that final approach track, just like that boat would need to point its bow into the stream of the river to do the same thing. This is called establishing a crab angle, and it's very effective as long as you just need to get the aircraft down to the runway. But once you're over the runway, you can't really land with this crab angle in, or at least not the full amount of crab angle, as this would cause a lot of strain on the landing gear. So therefore, we need to decrab or align ourselves with the runway just before landing. This is especially important on dry runways, as on wet and slippery ones, there would be a little bit of less side forces if you do land with a crab. But in any case, as soon as the aircraft decrabs, it will start to be pushed by the crosswinds towards the downwind runway edge. This decrabbing, therefore, must happen quite late in the landing sequence, meaning that the pilots often will have to combine both the decrabbing and the flare at the same time, which can be a little bit tricky. Because of this, basically the need to maintain directional control and to stay on the runway, aircraft are restricted to a maximum amount of crosswind. That tends to be in the region of 30 to 35 knots or so, reducing if the runway becomes more slippery, since the directional control then also becomes harder. So as you can see, a crosswind landing is a technically quite tricky maneuver, which is why less experienced pilots might have further restrictions on the maximum amount of crosswind that they are allowed to land with. An aircraft might, for example, be restricted to 30 knots, but an inexperienced pilot might only be able to do 15, and these type of restrictions often differ between different airlines. But even experienced pilots will have to be very focused when they fly approaches with crosswind close to maximum, and if you add that those winds are then gusty as well, it obviously becomes even more complicated. And if you on top of that have to then land on a short runway as well, well, then you can be quite sure that whoever has the controls will be on their highest alert and will be trying to apply all applicable techniques to get that aircraft down safely, quickly, and to bring it to a stop as quickly as they can. All of those factors will play an important role in what's about to happen here, but we'll get to that after this. Sometimes life can hit us in really unfair ways, and it can feel like whatever you do, things are just not going your way. I've gone through a period like that during the last six months, where I've moved to a different country, tried to navigate some super tight bureaucracy, while still maintaining the same output levels and being there for my family. And it's exactly in cases like this where therapy might be super important, to both help you to get through those times, and also to maybe reach even higher professional levels. That's why I am so happy to have BetterHelp as the sponsor of this episode, as they have created this fantastic tool to do just that from the comfort of your own home or wherever you feel most comfortable. To start, BetterHelp will ask you to fill in a short questionnaire and they will then assign you with a licensed therapist within 48 hours. After that, you can schedule meetings with your therapist via video chat, 
messaging or phone calls, whatever works best for you. And you can also change therapists if you feel like the fit is not right. BetterHelp has been a great help for me personally in improving my self-esteem and fight the imposter syndrome. And I know that I can do the very same for you. So if you want to become the best version of yourself or just need someone to talk to, then use the link here below, which is betterhelp.com slash mentorpilot. Or choose mentorpilot during sign up to get a special discount on your first month of therapy. Thank you, BetterHelp. Now back to the story. The latest weather the pilots received was 80s information Charlie, which was recorded at time 0956. It indicated that runway 30 was in use as expected, with a wind from 250 degrees, 24 knots, gusting 29. This would have given an average crosswind component of around 20 knots. The report also mentioned that there was storm clouds in the vicinity of the airport and that a combined snow and rain shower had passed the airport just 10 minutes before the aircraft was expected to land. Having said that, the visibility and cloud layers were good and all in all, there was nothing stopping the pilots from actually starting this approach. So the captain just briefed the first officer for a standard ILS approach into runway 30 and once that was completed, the crew asked air traffic control for initial descent, all according to their normal procedures. Now before we get into the incident sequence, I promised earlier to explain a few technical details about the CFM-56 engines fitted to this Airbus. In essence, apart from some minor differences in fan diameter and construction, they were the same two-shaft high-bypass turbofans which are being used on the Boeing 737NG that I fly. But there was one major difference. On the 737, the thrust reverser system is compiled by hydraulically operated translating sleeves, which when activated changes the direction of the air running through the bypass duct into a forward direction. But on the Airbus engines, this same effect was accomplished by the help of four pivoting blocker doors instead. These doors were also hydraulically activated by separate actuator arms for each door, and they were secured in the locked closed position by both a tine inside of the actual actuator and a separate hydromechanical primary door latch. These latches and activators were controlled by something known as the Engine Control Unit, ECU, and it was depending on several digital inputs like the sensed thrust lever angle in the cockpit, signals from the position microswitches in the reverser doors themselves, and most importantly, the air ground sensing signals from the weight on wheel switches inside of each main landing gear. Those switches would activate when the shock absorbers compressed after touchdown and was one of the required signals for the function of the thrust reversers, both for activation and deactivation. Now the reason that there were two separate locks fitted to the reversers was because of required changes that came after the terrible accident of Lauda Air 004, which I've actually covered in an earlier episode. Those upgrades should in theory have made in-flight reverser deployments impossible. Now, in order to actually activate the reversers, the Airbus pilots had to pull up two flaps on the front of the thrust levers and then pull the thrust levers further back beyond the forward thrust idle position. Provided that the ECU then felt that the aircraft was on the ground, it would initiate the unlocking and activation process of the blocker doors and after that was complete, start spooling up the engines to provide the reverse thrusts. Now, those of you who have been following this channel for a while know that a go-around can be initiated at any point, up until the reverses have been selected. But once the reverses have been selected, the pilots are completely committed to the landing, so a go-around is no longer an option. But even though you might have heard that before, you might not know why that is. And by the way, if you haven't been following the channel, then what are you waiting for? Subscribe now. Anyway. There are several different reasons why we should never go around after having selected reverse thrust. For one, it will actually take a relatively long time for the aircraft to go from reverse thrust, then deactivate and lock the reverses, and then spool the engine up again if go around is requested, meaning that there might just not be enough thrust available quickly enough to safely execute the go around. But equally important, you never want to put the aircraft in a position where you risk activating full forward thrust on one engine while still having low or even reverse thrust on the other. This has actually happened on Pacific Airlines Flight 314, which crashed at Cranbrook International Airport in Canada back in 1978. And ever since that happened, this rule of never attempting to go around after reverses have been selected have been strictly enforced by pilots on all aircraft types around the world. 
The Cranbrook accident also changed the certification requirements for transport category aircraft to make sure that an aircraft could always both land, select reverses, then store them again and apply takeoff thrust with both reverses deactivating safely, even though that should never happen. These new rules were applied in Canada first, then by the FAA in the United States, and even though the exact same rules were not implemented by EASA in Europe, in effect all aircraft manufacturers still follow them. But compliance with these certification rules were only really tested on aircraft after they had fully landed and selected reverse thrust. Remember that. TAP Flight 174 was eventually given gradual descent clearances down towards Copenhagen and a few minutes past 10 UTC they were handed over to the Copenhagen Approach Controller who started vectoring them for the ILS approach for runway 30. The pilots had completed all relevant checklists by then except for the landing checklist so the captain started asking for flaps to be extended and around 10 o'clock the aircraft had fully intercepted the ILS and started descending down towards the runway. The weather on approach was turbulent, but well within the capability of the pilots, and at time 10, 01 and 55 seconds, the landing gear was selected down, shortly followed by the flaps being moved into the landing position, position 3. They were now completely configured for the landing when the pilots were handed over from the approach controller to the Castrop tower controller, but before that handover took place, the previous controller also asked the crew to try to vacate the runway via taxiway Delta. This would make the available rollout distance even shorter, 1530 meters to be exact, and the crew commented on this being a little bit much to ask for. But a request from the tower is nothing more than just a request, and if the aircraft is not able to do that, well, then that's just the way that it is. But we pilots always try to comply with those kind of requests if we can. It's likely that this request was made to try and minimize the aircraft's time on the runway as Copenhagen was using only runway 30 for arrivals at this time and the pilots likely knew that. Anyway, as this was happening, the aircraft descended to 1420 feet and the captain suddenly decided to disengage the autopilot and continue the approach manually. Now the autopilot can be used much lower than that, even past the minimize needed, but it's pretty common that we pilots disengage it a bit earlier when the weather is bad. We tend to do this to try and get a better feel for the aircraft and prepare for the manual landing that's ahead, but it's also just because it's really fun. At time 10.05 and 5 seconds, the tower controller cleared TAP Flight 174 for landing runway 30. The aircraft was now fully ready for landing and with the gusty winds and the tower controller's request in the back of his head, it's very likely that the captain was very focused on getting the aircraft down correctly, on the mark and get the brakes and reverses working as soon as possible, especially with the wet runway that he could now clearly see ahead of him. The approach continued in a stabilized manner with only minor speed deviations down past the threshold where the GPWS started calling out 50, 40, 30, 20. 10. Retard. And at 30 feet, the captain started the flare and also simultaneously straightened the aircraft out from the crab. His hands were just resting on the reverser flaps at this point, and as soon as the wheels started spinning up, even before the shock observers had properly compressed, he pulled up the flaps and then pulled the thrust levers back into reverse thrust. Now, as I mentioned before, the reverses would only activate once the weight on wheel switches were also fully activated, which also soon happened, meaning that the reverser doors now started opening on both sides. And at the same time, the spoilers also activated on the wings, bringing the weight of the aircraft down onto the shock absorbers and the brakes. But probably due to the strong crosswinds, the aircraft now also started drifting and rolling a bit to the right, causing the left landing gear to slightly get airborne again for just a fraction of a second. The captain didn't like this rolling and drifting motion at all, and he therefore, instead of continuing the landing, instead now started executing an immediate go-around, also known as a bulk landing. Like I said at the very beginning, a bulk landing is a maneuver which requires a lot of firm but also delicate handling. This is to avoid over-rotating and possibly causing a tail strike, or in this case even a wing or nacelle strike, since the aircraft was in a right bank. It's also important to make sure that the aircraft has the correct speed and attitude to safely get airborne again, but as he now moved the thrust levers from reverse thrust into full toga thrust, something very strange started happening. <laughs> 
Because this decision had been taken in the middle of a shallow bounce when the left gear was in the air but the right was still touching, a difference of commands were now sent from the ECU to the thrust reverser circuits. In the case of the right engine, since the weight on wheel switches were still activated, the stow commands were sent and locked into the execution memory for the computer for the next 8 seconds, causing the reverses to stow as designed and then start increasing the forward thrust for the go around. But for the left engine, the same commands were also received, but since its main gear was indicating airborne, during exactly the 180 milliseconds that this command was given, it was not locked into the memory and therefore not executed. This meant that three out of the four reverser doors now remained open, creating more drag as the engine was commanded into full forward thrust. Both weight on wheel switches soon activated again as the aircraft continued its initial bounce, but since the commands had already been sent, this didn't change anything. In the cockpit, the first officer had not had time to call out either reverses unlocked or spoilers before the captain had made the decision to go around, so it is possible that the captain wasn't even fully aware that he had activated reverses when he took the decision to instead go around. But let me take this opportunity to reiterate, never try to go around after the reverses have been selected. Because what happened now was like a scene taken straight from a fiction novel. As the right engine started spooling up, the left engine was thankfully inhibited from doing the same, since the system felt that it still had the reverses deployed and therefore activated something known as auto-idle. This fact was likely the one thing that saved the situation from becoming immediately catastrophic, but it was still pretty bad. An enormous amount of asymmetric thrust from the roaring right engine and the now idle left one now started affecting the aircraft, causing an immediate yaw and roll towards the left. The captain, who was not prepared for this at all, started trying to control the aircraft but obviously didn't react with inputting right rudder fast enough. This meant that the aircraft was now lurching towards the left runway edge with its left wingtip only feet away from hitting the ground. At the same time, the first officer had noticed that the go-around maneuver had been initiated and had therefore selected the flap lever to position 2, which was the go-around setting. The aircraft bounced once again before the nose slowly lifted just enough to get it airborne, meaning that it just barely cleared the left edge of the runway, but still without climbing much. The captain was still struggling to try and understand why his previously fully functioning aircraft was now almost unflyable, and on top of that, the slip and skid indicator on his primary flight display, also known as the beta target, now also stopped working and was replaced with a flag. This indicator normally shows if the aircraft is slipping, meaning turning with too little rudder, or skidding, meaning turning with too much rudder, and it's very helpful when dealing with asymmetric thrust, as it will show the pilot how much rudder to input to fly the aircraft correctly and thus enable it to climb. So that indicator would have been really helpful here, but unfortunately, an internal setting in the computer of this indicator was set to inhibit if the thrust traverses was selected. In any case, the aircraft now continued, barely flying out of the safety area next to the runway and managed to gain just enough altitude to not slam into the glide slope antenna for the opposite runway. At that stage, the pilots judged that they had enough positive climb rate to retract the gear, which the first officer also did. He then called out, go around to ATC, and at almost the same time, he also noticed an engine one reverser unlocked warning on the aircraft's ECAM display. He called this out to the captain, who now finally got an explanation to why his aircraft was behaving the way it did. He reacted by input about half deflection of right rudder, and then raised the nose to 12.5 degrees, which is normally the climb attitude to keep in case of an engine failure after takeoff. This finally got the aircraft climbing again with about 1,000 feet per minute, but it still passed only meters over the houses in a nearby village. As it finally reached about 300 feet of radio altitude, the captain made a mayday call to Kastrup Tower and requested to climb straight ahead to 3,000 feet. Now, as I have pointed out before in many of my previous videos, even though the urge to communicate might be very strong in situations like this, it's probably better to adhere to the golden rule of aviate, navigate and then communicate here. Because ATC does not need to know that you're going around when you're at 10 feet, nor that you have an emergency at 300. It's better to just concentrate on flying the aircraft at that point and get it safely away from any obstacles and terrain.
Anyway, the request was obviously approved by the tower, the aircraft continued to climb and as soon as it was deemed appropriate, the first officer then started actioning the ECAM actions for the engine 1 reverser unlocked warning that they had. This included shutting down the left engine completely, which they did as the aircraft passed about 1200 feet climbing. When that was done, the beta target indication then suddenly reappeared again. Better late than never, I guess. The captain now proceeded with re-engaging the autopilot and continued to climb to 3000 feet in order to prepare for the next step. Now before I tell you the end of this story, I want to take the opportunity here to point out a few very important things. This incident highlighted a previously unknown weakness in the Airbus ECU reverse logic on Airbus A320s with the CFM56 engines fitted. A modification is now being worked on to solve this issue and the same goes for the problem with the side slip or beta index. But having said that, Airbus also looked through all of the available data that they had from more than 95 million flights with this particular aircraft type and it seems like this was the only time that this particular fault had ever occurred. But what they did find when they were looking through that data is potentially much more worrying. You see, it turns out that the instances of pilots landing, selecting reverse thrust and then still choosing to go around happen about once every 1 million flights. Now, that might sound very rare, but with the amount of flights that we're operating with the Airbus A320, at the moment at least, that means that this is happening on average once every month. And remember, this investigation only involved the Airbus A320. Given that this rule of never going around after thrust reverses have been deployed is common for the whole airliner world and that we all, or at least all of us pilots, react pretty much the same to the same conditions, this could indicate that this same thing is happening on all fleets and therefore represents a very real risk, possibly a bigger risk than I have ever seen in the context of these investigations before. So if you are a pilot out there and you want to take one thing away from this video, it should be if you have landed and selected reverse thrust, you are staying on the ground. A rejected landing is no longer an option. And if you're an airline safety manager out there, I would encourage you to fit these parameters into your OFDM system. Landing, reverse thrust selected and then go around within the next 10 seconds. It would be really interesting to hear what kind of information that that type of check will bring because it is possible that we have a real problem on our hands here. Anyway, the crew of Flight 174 eventually leveled off at 3000 feet and then completed the associated checklist. They then briefed their cabin crew and passengers and returned for vectors into a successful single engine landing on runway 22 left in Copenhagen about 20 minutes after this terrible ordeal had started. Now they chose that runway because it had an available landing distance of 3,300 meters, which was significantly longer than runway 30, which they had previously used. Extra distance is something that's really needed when landing single engine, since the approach is flown with lower flap settings and therefore higher speeds. After they had landed, the aircraft taxied into the stand and all 109 passengers and crew could safely disembark the aircraft. Both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder was successfully saved and downloaded and together with films from surveillance cameras around the airport and witness testimonies from the pilots, this story was later put together piece by piece by the investigation team. Now I have already mentioned some of the safety recommendations that came out of this investigation but on top of those it was also recommended that the certification requirements for new aircraft should be updated once again. This time with the requirement that the reverse system must be able to completely and successfully be cancelled not only after a successful full landing but also during a worst case scenario with a bounced landing. Because of this, aviation is now taking one more step towards further improving safety and that's without anyone getting hurt which is the best kind of steps. Please consider supporting the work that my team and I do here in whatever way that you feel appropriate. There are links to my Patreon page somewhere here on the screen or in the description, but just a happy comment or a like on the video also helps a lot. Please check out these videos next and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye bye.